This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have Ryan Fisher, the CEO and founder of Chalk Performance Training. Yes. Got it. <laughs> All right, Chalk Performance Training. So, you know, we were talking earlier, you are unique in the fact that a lot of people know you for CrossFit, uh, although I even know that you started your athletic career in one of my favorite sports, which was BMX. Oh, yeah. Right, in Jersey? Yep. <laughs> so it's interesting because, you know, the bicycle is going to the wayside with all the other things going around, like the birds mm -hmm. and the skateboarding and whatever. You don't see as much about BMX as I think you should. Um, tell me, though, how the – because you really had to be in good shape to, to race BMX, to ride BMX. How did that affect kind of your transition evolution towards – all the other athletic things that you were doing that aren't related to, for example, being a BMX. Well, there's actually two pieces of this. So like while I was racing BMX, I also got a job on a watermelon farm. In New Jersey. In New Jersey. And so while I was racing, like when I was racing, I knew that I had a lot of athletic potential that like a lot of other kids didn't have. And as soon as I would get out of school, the first thing I wanted to do was ride my bike, what would be equivalent to like an hour car drive away. <laughs> to go to these dirt jumps that I was obsessed with because they were in this BMX magazine. And then <clears throat> I also got this job from my mom. My mom got remarried and this guy didn't think that, you know, I could work hard. And he basically challenged me with this job of taking watermelon out of a truck and putting it in these bins. <laughs> That's and I awesome. did. So I would ride my bike all morning and then I'd get out of school and then or sometimes I wake up even before school, ride my bike and then I'd go and go to school. And then after I would have this crazy job. And before I knew it, I started realizing that as a young, young kid, I was, you know, out beating some of these adults who were having had the same job. And I found out that I was strong and I found out I was competitive. And I found out like all these things about myself that I, I really didn't know existed because no one in my family, I grew up with a big family like you. Yeah. I had, I grew up in a house with five brothers and sisters and I have three other sisters on my dad's side. Um, and basically... I was just finding all these things out because I was not, none of them were like me. Like, right. Some of them are hairdressers and some of them are in, in the wrong path in general. <laughs> and I was just this very different kid. I was just, I was so different from yeah. everybody else in my family. It's interesting because, you know, I had five siblings and they're extremely academic, extremely intellectual, extremely calm and focused. And I remember I was hearing ADD, some of these right? stories. Crazy. <clears throat> um, and I had a lot of energy that I used. A lot of times, you know, I'm looking at what other people would take as weaknesses and they become our strengths. So where did school fit into, you know, there's a lot of physical activity and how did it affect, you know, as a little kid, you're also hyper competitive. Tell me about the academic side of going to school. It was the same. I wanted to get the best grades I possibly could. And I, and I did. And I remember telling my mom that I was going to fail all the time. I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to fail this class, blah, blah, blah. And she'd call the teacher cause she was all concerned. And she, and the teacher would be like, Ryan has like a B, a B plus, and he's, freak he's, and he's, and he's freaking out. And my mom always loves to tell that story. She's like, Ryan, like if he wasn't a perfectionist, like he wouldn't even tell anybody. I, I, I was um, like second in the world in in running some of the running events in in like high school and some <laughs> other different different things that I did. In the country. And if I wasn't like in the country, sorry. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was number one in the world for BMX at, at, in one particular year. Crazy. But I wouldn't let anyone come to anything that I was doing, an event, practice, nothing, unless I felt like I was going to be the absolute standout best person there. Like, I would literally beg my mom not to come to practices or come to events if I didn't know I was going to win. You know, this goes to that unconscious competency of some people. We start developing, you know, this consistent behavior. We can use our personality traits, characteristics, obsessions, and addictions to go to the positive or the negative. And here early on, you became really addicted to this perfection of what you were doing, a pursuit of perfection, a pursuit of your potential. Where does like a passion, you know, I love asking these people because you're entrepreneurial as well. We were talking about how you're not just a CrossFit, you know, own chalk, the performance training center, like literally in, in, in you are an entrepreneur. You have all these other businesses, all these other ventures, even branding yourself as a, a influencer. But where do you see those personality traits kind of conforming to who you actually are? That's a deep question. Sorry. But, uh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I didn't actually know who my father was until I was 18. 
I was, I was, I was told that. And then from there, when I found out who he was, I was like, I grew up almost being just like him. It's yeah. crazy. I was telling you how different I was than everybody in my family, and I was just like him the whole time. And I feel like I just had these, I had these genetics inside of me, and then, and it was just like, this is who you're gonna be, and I didn't really have a choice. I remember seeing my brothers and my sisters every day, like they'd be doing something totally different than me. And I feel like as the youngest person in the household, the first thing you want to do is be like your older brothers or sisters. You know, it's like, it's normal. Yeah. But I just never felt that way. Even if they did something good, a lot of them did things that were bad. But a lot of the times I was just like, I just don't want to be like that. I don't feel the same. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be like that. Like everything to me was so much different. And I always just felt like I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I'd I'd get on my bike and I would just go, I would go crazy. I would just go, I'd ride an, an hour car ride away. I remember when the first phone came out and it was a prepaid phone because it was a Nextel. Yeah. It was a you know, walkie talkie. And uh, mine was prepaid at the time. And I called my mom one day and I said, I have a flat tire. And she said, where, where are you? And I told her where she, where I was. And she like lost it. Cause you're so like, far away. It's going to take me an hour to get there. How'd you even get there? <laughs> and you've been doing it for years <laughs> riding your bike. For years. Wow. Since I was like 10. Wow. And so when you started getting in the business world, where was your first job? Like real job? Oh man, my first real job was a gym attendant at a gym. And from there I was training for the Olympics. I was on the skeleton and bobsled team yep. for five years in, in Park City, Utah. I mean that, that was my that was my first job. We can go from there wherever you want to go. Yeah, so that. that first job. Now you end up getting hurt, so you don't get to go to the Olympics. Yes, correct. Which is, you know, and how do you feel at that time? Because so many people, the Olympics is such a strange oh. thing because you have to work so hard for one little moment for four years. Yeah, not one. So like that's what was cool when I switched to the CrossFit. It was we had world championships every year, and I had a lot of things in my life where I would get to this just crazy high level, and something bad would happen every single time. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. I, but still, you know, today you know, you know what? I do th- I have an idea, and I think that every time something really bad happens to me, this amazing thing happens after. And I feel like now, looking back on it now, it was meant to be that way. And I could say that for so many things right now. Like I wish this podcast was longer so I could <laughs> connect all that's, the dots. That's for my you. secret. That's my secret, though. So <clears throat> I believe every setback is a setup, right? I like that. And those and lessons keep coming. I would never say you were. Tr- that you were correct until now and so you can look back on it mm-hmm. and that's one thing that comes with just experience and age is you start looking back and going wow i don't have to get so scared about this because every time something happens when i'm going in what i thought was the right, right direction to the point where i'm hyper competitive like and i've done this and this is an entrepreneurial lesson for the playbook that should doesn't come up a lot but shouldn't be missed is i've done businesses the same way right and i get and it felt like man i always get right there and I never have a breakthrough, right? And, and and I'm thinking to myself the same exact thing. Why is that? And then I start realizing, well, every time then something, another lesson is something better and another lesson is something better until all of a sudden they all have aggregated into like, wow, huge breakthrough because I've learned the lessons. The lessons are going to keep on coming until I learn them and I learn the lessons I needed to learn in order to expand and accelerate and grow to a point where I can seriously have this acceleration and, and growth. Now, it is really interesting because you are one of those people that are hyper successful at whatever you tried. You know, academics, BMX, Olympic bobsledder, and then you get involved after the Olympics in CrossFit, Mm -hmm. right? That was the initial? Correct. Because you were a part-time job, is that why you got interested or how did that transition happen? So after I got injured, I was like, do I want to do this for another four years? (sighs) You know what I mean? And I... At the time, and Bo I, Jackson wanted your job by then. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time, I was a helicopter pilot too. That's that was, cool. That was my first thing that I did out of high school, and I wanted to go into the military to be a pilot. And after the whole Olympic thing was done, I started realizing that I was a hell of an athlete, and I wanted to go in the military and do something more than just flying. So I decided that I maybe I would do special forces, and I went to a CrossFit gym to train because everyone said that that was the best way to train to go into the military. And my first day there, the owner of the gym was, he got second at the world championships and I didn't know who he was. And he just saw me and I just saw his eyes just light up like, this is the guy. Like, I need this guy to train with me and all this stuff. And I was like, hey, just so you know, like, I'm not really into this. I'm using this as a stepping stone. 
And he's like, we'll see, we'll see. You know, he's wearing his Reeboks, his high top Reeboks. And within time. a couple of months, I was like all over every, you know, every article, every magazine. People, everybody wanted to talk to me. I was like doing all these freakish things. I didn't understand how good they were because I right. just didn't understand the sport. And yeah, before you were I knew just doing it, what you could do. Before I knew it, I'd taken over my whole life. What are some of the components that, like, the skills that you had that translated so well? Like, what what were those? I loved being, and I still do, like, love just being in just a super uncomfortable state of just pain in my body and I just love it and I I feel like when once I get to that area I want to see how far I can push it and I remember being at my first big actually my second big regional event which is when you qualify for world championships and I told my friend it was really really hot outside and they have to be careful in this event and I said I'll 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 die before I lose this event cuz it, it was my event <laughs> You're like Ray Lewis, man. I and I it. have a photo I can show you where I legit almost did die. So I finished the event. I beat everyone by like minutes, which is unheard of. I had the world record in the event. I beat the number one athlete in the world at the time, which was Rich Froning. He won the games like three times. And he, his winning time was indoor. Mine was outdoor on a black parking lot in Southern California. It was like 110 degrees outside. Oh. As soon as I finished my last rep, I fell on the ground, blacked out, complete dark. And then I was pulled away uh, on a stretcher, and I had like an IV and an oxygen tank and like all this stuff. And this was the second day, and it was three days. And I came back still the last day, and I was one place away from going to world championships. And everyone remembers that event <clears throat> like more than anything. And that was like when I started my Instagram. Because <sighs> everybody's like, dude, you need to be on Instagram. Like people <laughs> need to see that you're like out of your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right, I'll start it. I'm just not going to post anything. I got to work out. Yeah. And uh, and obviously, once you figured out Instagram, that became another thing that you became really good at. It took a while for me to like actually want to put time into it. But then I started realizing that I really, really liked helping people. Like Once I opened my gym, I, I realized the effect that you could have on other people. And I started to just put my time in different things. And once the gym was up and running enough where I had time to do more things, that was when I started playing with the Instagram a little bit more. I actually just really started getting into it like maybe two or three years ago. And you know, a lot of people follow their passion and they would think that, you know, with your chalk business, that that came from your passion for CrossFit and fitness in general. But it wouldn't happen but for a whole nother realm of the world of being in the right place at the right time, asking for help, being nice, being kind. How, how did you get the funding for your gym? So I never asked for help. I've always been really bad at that. Which but. I'm teaching you to do, by the way. That's my main <laughs> objective. I'm going to have you be obsessed about asking for help, and you're going to accelerate like beyond belief. <laughs> but what I always try to tell people is to just you know, put the best version of yourself out there. And you had a term for that. Yeah, like, pursue uh, your potential, right? And, Consistent your, and your future self. Oh, be kind to your future <laughs> self. Yes. So the man who helped me, which coincidentally you actually know, he, him and f various other people were always asking to help me. And I was like, you know what? Like, I really, really respect this one guy. I really, really trust him. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. And I was terrified, and it worked out, and it just connected this just crazy, crazy, just multiple paths that I have now, which is amazing because there was a point that we, we skipped over, and we don't have enough time to hit it, but I was homeless sleeping in my car for a couple of days and then eventually slept, slept on someone's couch who I didn't know for a few months, and then I was stealing a lot from right. whole, uh, whole foods from to whole eat. Foods. Yeah. And it was just a, a terrible, terrible tangent that went on for a long time. And if a lot of things didn't happen at the right time, like there's so many moments that if I went left instead of right, it would have just been a totally different scenario. I don't think I'm lucky. I'd like to call it like just a ridiculous amount of preparation just meets opportunity. So, you know, <clears throat> you're someone who can withstand a lot of pain, right? You have a great threshold for pain. And through being homeless and having to steal food to live and all of those, you probably could handle it and still keep a pretty positive perspective. Did you ever want to quit? All the time. Really? <laughs> not like, not like because I actually, no, I don't think I did want to quit. Okay, that's I never wanted like to you. quit like what I was passionate about. Yeah. I wanted to take the easy route out a few times mentally because I was like, man, well, what like if this what, doesn't Mary, work? Mary Rich? What's, uh, what was it? <laughs> Mary Rich. Oh, yeah. I, I heard your story about one. Mary. <laughs> right. <yeah>. Um, <laughs> you know what? No, that, this is, that was totally inaccurate. Like, I, I never quit my dream, and I actually always talk about how you should always stick with your passion forever. 
and I did. I just was I was nervous a lot. I would mm-hmm. get nervous to I'm one of those people like if I really want to buy something, I'll research it forever before I buy it. <laughs> and I'll spend way more time researching it than it yeah. would have cost if I just I lose money yeah, from researching this two hundred dollar thing that like I've spent hours looking at and I could have just bought it and probably Oh I'll give a quick <laughs> example that I used to try to save money by finding the cheapest gas and I started realizing the amount of time <laughs> and gas that I waited yeah. wasted trying to save two cents on the cheapest gas. Staying in the was, Costco line? Yeah, it was so <clears throat> stupid. Yeah. And it's that's like a, two cents out of ten gallon tank. <laughs> and that's how my decision making is. It's just like it's very slow to go. <laughs> but then once I hit it, it's it's great. And um, yeah, I'm ecstatic. And so now that you have that it. awareness, right? Yes. So as we get older, have more situations now, you have this awareness of how you do things. What are you doing to correct that? <sighs> I mean, I'm not really doing a whole bunch of things to really work on my, my own self. So I got a great book. Game time decision making <laughs> behind me. I'm gonna give you a copy. The more you talked about it, I'm like, I that is something I actually do need to read. Oh, because it's not the decisions we make; it's the assumptions that we make and the procedures and situations that we put ourselves in to make the decisions. Everybody makes inherently good decisions. That's the way our human body, mind, and soul. It's what we do before we make the decision that actually tricks us. Right? One bad assumption, you can screw up your entire life. One bad assumption, one procedure, like hundred percent. Like your buying decision was fine. It was just what you had to do to get up to the decision. And that's why I call it game time decision making. It's like, what am I doing before the game? Because the game time decisions all come inherently within the context of a rational decision. We qualify things quite well, but we make really bad uh, pre plan yeah. in gaming and et cetera. Now, through this all, you now live uh, a more abundant, extraordinary life. What do you see is next? Because you're not going to lose that best in the world attitude and you're going to get a little bit older. And so the fitness side, you can have your category, you know, best over 30, then best over 40. But what like bigger picture things do you see now for yourself in that same competitive, competitive lens? I never really had that like full family type of feel um, in my life in general. So I mean, my mom has been great, and I had all b- million brothers and sisters, but I never really felt like this full family. And I, I, I want to build something so big that I have all these people working for me that feels like a giant family. Oh, that's awesome. I will tell you, when you don't like someone, wish upon them employees and overhead. So maybe be careful. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice. Hiring and firing is, is Maybe just is, get married and have eight kids. That's easy. Yeah, that, yeah could be, that could be it. Although <laughs> my wife was having difficulty with my teenage daughters today. And I'm like, if you don't like someone, wish upon them teenage daughters. <laughs> <laughs> and then give them two minutes in the future. <laughs> two minutes a day. Right. I, well, you've had an extraordinary journey. <laughs> What piece of advice, right? I believe the lessons keep on coming till we learn it. What's that one piece of advice that you would share with someone that is passionate about a particular thing, entrepreneurial, they want to make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun like yourself, you know, whether maybe someone's out there on their iPhone listening to the podcast, you know, living in their car, homeless, you know, and they need that catalyst. You know, that's what I love about Gary Vee. That's something that I really inspire to do is I, I want to be the catalyst for people. And it's so nice with the videos. We're like, man, you changed my life. What's that piece of advice that somebody's listening to the playbook right now? And they're like, oh, thank you, Ryan. I needed that. So 100% for me is to make sure that you're putting the best version of yourself out there all the time. Like when I first opened my gym, before I opened my gym, the way that I coached classes, the way that I talked to certain people, I was the first person they thought of to invest in. I was the first person they thought of when they wanted to talk to somebody about something in fitness or I was the you know the first most motivated person they had ever met or something like that and it's easy when you're down to just be angry at people let's say you are in your car and you meet the next you know someone's like says something to you and you're just angry you know you yeah. never know that person could change your life in a second and then maybe that person doesn't change your life but they know someone who who can do it for you you know what I mean it's just crazy it's an ongoing cycle and that yourself your first impression for everybody is so 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 important i mean it's just as important as when someone walks in my gym if they don't see the value in the place they don't someone doesn't say hi to them they're gone and that's exactly how they're going to remember you when they meet you yeah and i think that's the absolute most important thing i agree and you are so kind to your future self and it's so important i also you know relevant to what you said is you never know who your gatekeepers are the best things that ever happened to me ever have never been anything i expected me, me either. Somebody was like, you should do this. 
the biggest impact. I my job at Lee Steinberg, I was helping out a friend. I wasn't looking for a job. Meeting Warren Moon, who's my best friend and business partner today, same type of chance as your big investor, et cetera. And you know, it's just extraordinary how if you are open and doing your best, living your best self, like you said, and being Be kind, yourself. you know, just literally you can't have that attacking thoughts and scarcity and anger and anxiety. That'll come out towards other people and they'll be really deflected by you instead you want people to embrace you be attracted to you and i from the time you walked into my office i could tell you and i are going to be good friends <laughs> and uh you just you walk the walk my brother and i think everyone if you don't follow ryan definitely check him out uh ryan fisher and chalk uh performance training is uh his business as well as many other great accomplishments i really haven't I'm an eclectic guy when you went through my career, you know, I was on Ryan's show and I always think like, man, I got such a kooky career. I'm a sports guy and it's very rare. You talk through the, like being world's best at BMX, CrossFit, all these different, bobsledding. I'm like, oh my God, this guy could have done anything. And I just hope that others are encouraged to do what they believe in. And it's a matter of true, true aptitude and having that great threshold like you to desire. So thank you so much for coming on the um, playbook. I'm so happy to be here. You're awesome. Ryan Fisher with Dave Meltzer on Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.